Blessing. How many know that one of the things in our lives to recognize before we talk about living in the blessing is to understand that in order to live in the blessing, there has also been a cursing, okay? And you need to recognize that. I was in Bible school in Stony Brook, Long Island, New York, and I had a professor that had it all backwards, and I wasn't about to argue with him, but he would quote from the book of Job and said, can we not expect both blessing and cursing from the Lord? And I'm going to show you today that that's just absolutely craziness, because that's just sort of expecting you to be one in minute you're a loving mother, and the next minute you're a hateful, evil mother. Uh, that's actually not how your genetic makeup works, okay? And God is perf perfect, and so in order for God to be perfect, He doesn't struggle with these things. He's not got two different personalities. He's not back and forth on things. So we're just going to get you. let that settle in your mind for just a minute. We'll let everybody get seated. Praise the Lord. And we're going to look at, in order to live in the blessing, you've got to understand that, that there is not a curse in God that He wants to bring to you. Okay, uh, If there are terrible, tragic things that go on in life, we want to look at why those things happen and what we can do to change those things. How many know the, the scripture says, what, what does John 10.10 10 say? He comes to destroy. He comes to destroy. There you go. A number of different versions, but the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, I want us to focus on that while we get everybody settled down. The thief has come, that's not for you, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy, but, and how many know the but changes the whole sentence, or the whole meaning of that, doesn't it? The thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I'm not going to get into it today because we've all heard about it, and, and, and it's tragic in some of the, the situations that have gone on in this world that we live in in this past couple of weeks. And we would recognize, first of all, before you read all of the posts that well-meaning will people will put up and say, God somehow can use tragedy in these situations to bring people to the Lord. Okay, That sounds really, really religious, but you know what? Let's be truthful. We don't really believe that. Okay, If somebody came to the Lord through the love of Christ, wonderful, but God does not work with the devil to say, let's do really bad things to bring people to their knees so that some people might get saved. There would be many people, I had enough coffee this week to flood a nation, there would be many people that would say, why would I ever serve a God that would let something tragic happen to somebody such as what we have just witnessed and read about. Well, not witnessed, but read about, okay? And, and, and they're absolutely right. Why would you serve a God that would do such a thing in order to get somebody saved? That doesn't make any sense. So we're going to crush somebody's life to make somebody else's life better? That doesn't work. So the thief comes to steal, period. But Jesus has come to give life and life in abundance. That's something that you've got to enjoy or got to recognize in order to enjoy the blessing that God has. Now, um, there is something in our lives that we must represent, which is Jesus in us. And Jesus in us is complete love. The Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. Because how many know that fear involves torment? Well, we know that torment is from the enemy. We know then that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So think about your life. You say, well, Pastor, I haven't had tragedy in my life. Well, praise the Lord for that. But how many could recognize that maybe a thief has tried to come? How many could recognize that maybe a thief has tried to come in? Maybe he's tried to steal your job. Maybe he's tried to steal your joy. Maybe he's tried to steal your hope. Maybe he's tried to steal your family. Maybe he's tried to steal your marriage. Maybe he's tried to steal, I don't know, the finances because your car keeps breaking. And maybe you need to stomp your little foot in the ground and say, no more is the enemy going to steal from me because Jesus has come to give us life and life in abundance. I want us to go, if we would, before we get too far into this, because I'm pretty excited about this. But you've got to recognize, number one, that there is a thief in the earth. There is a thief in the earth. How many know thieves plot and plan? Okay? How many know thieves plot and plan? They plot and plan and try and figure out... We're good, Joe. Let's just... <laughs> My ADD kicks in, and if everyone's moving around, I lose my spot. How, that's all right. How many know that if we're plotting, if the enemy is plotting and planning, he is trying to find ways to trick you up? Okay? 
How many know he's trying to find ways to sort of stump you and try and catch you? And if he can catch you, remember, remember my friend that used to have the monkey? And the one way with that monkey, he'd hold a chocolate bar outside the cage of that monkey, and that monkey would grab that candy bar, and he would not let go of that candy bar. You could pretty much cut his hand off because he is not going to let go of that candy bar. That's exactly what the enemy tries to do to us. You could lead him, you could guide him, you could do anything by kind of throwing out little things like that. And the enemy does that. He says, come here, come here. And he'll throw things your way, and you need to begin to recognize and say, I'm not going to allow the enemy try and capture my thoughts or capture my life. I'm not going to find myself caged or brought under the power of anything, because the enemy is going to be like a thief trying to stealthily attract you to something so that he can steal from you and rip you off. But we know that Jesus has come to give you life. And life in abundance. Now, how do we do that? Well, we know, first of all, that we do that through recognizing that the blood of Christ was shed so that we can have His living nature alive in us. In Him we live and move and have our being. So part of who you are needs to be the genetic makeup of Jesus. But how many know even Jesus was attacked? How many know Jesus was constantly, the Bible says he was not, you know, a prophetess without honor except in his own hometown. How many know that his brothers and sisters didn't like him? The Bible says they were offended at him. Amen? He, they were offended at him. Now go with me to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6. I bind every candy in the place. No. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, it's gone. Nehemiah chapter 6. Everybody relax. I'm just excited to preach. All right. Nehemiah chapter 6. I want to show you something. This is just, I'm only going to steal the slogan from Jesse Duplantis because he preached it 20 years ago. But I want you to catch that in the Old Testament, there was a lot of killing and stealing and terrible things going on. But I also want to show you that in the New Testament, it's just as rampant. But the good news is we have Jesus. The good news is we have the blood of Christ. The good news is we have the nature of Jesus on the inside of us that gives us all power and all authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That's not just a nice song that B.J. Thomas sung. It's the truth. You've got power living on the inside of you. So, chapter 6 of Nehemiah, page 681, if you've got my Bible. It says, Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and there were no breaks in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates. Sanballat, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is a type of the devil. He is trying to somehow discourage this man, trying to somehow stop this man from hanging the doors and building the gates and doing the project that God had given him. I want you to think of your life today. What is the project that you're busy with? What is the plan that you're busy with? What is the purpose that you're busy with? What, what future or hope or desire or idea do you have that suddenly the enemy is slowly trying to say, wait a second here, I think we better stop you before you get going. And so we see here that Sambal and, and, and Geshem, I don't know why God makes such weird words, but anyway, um, that Sambal and Geshem sent to me saying, come let us meet together among the villages in the plains of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Come, let's meet together in the valley of Ono. Now, how does that mean today? Well, think about this. Pastor's going to use that word, oh no. How many times in your life have you said, oh no? Oh no. I guarantee you, I guarantee you when Nehemiah got the letter that said, let's go meet in the valley, because they, and he knew they're going to do me harm, he said, oh no. You laugh, but you're going to remember this sermon. You think about it. What happens when you get that, that, that notice in the mail? Oh, no. The report says the cancer has tried to return. They're going to raise your property taxes. Oh, no. Carl was cooking. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. What in your life have you responded and said, oh, no. And you think that's, that's just, you know, we all know that that happens. We all know that that's a possibility in our lives where you could recognize and say, oh, no. How am I going to do this? Oh, no. Another failure. Oh, no. 
Another notice in the mail of a bill I can't pay. Oh, no. Another cut in my raise. Oh, no. The weather's bad. Oh, no. Nobody wants to talk. Oh, no. The family doesn't want to come for Christmas. I mean, there is a hundred different ways that you could look at this and understand this, though. The Old Testament isn't a lot different than the New Testament, except that now, in Jesus, we have victory. But there are some oh no's in your life. Maybe it's not oh no, maybe it's uh oh. <laughs> oh no, I failed again. You didn't fail again, it's a setback. It's not how many times you fail, it's how many times you get back up. Mm -hmm. You think about that for just a minute here. You look at a little person in the nursery that's learning how to fill his diaper and learning how to walk, and they hold on to coffee tables and they hold on to things, and they kind of waddle a few feet, and then they go boom right in their diaper. And, and, and if it's full, it's a softer landing. And they sit there, and then you know what they do? They wiggle around and they get back up. They grab onto something as a support to pull them back up, and they get waddling again. And before you know it, they're running. But you don't ever see a kid in the nursery say, I think I'm just going to stay sitting down on the floor because obviously walking isn't for me. Now, do the math on this for just a minute. You do not see somebody learning how to walk just decide to say, walking isn't working because it hasn't happened yet. They get back up until it happens. You need to do the same thing. You need to get back up and say, I'm, I may be down. I may be feeling like I'm down for the count. I may be feeling like I can't win. You may be realizing that suddenly you are in the valley of, oh, no. Except you need to grab onto something that's going to help you get your chubby little bum off the ground and get walking again because that's what God has planned for you. Okay? Chubby little bum is a phrase. All right? It's not sacrilegious and it's not talking about the size of the congregation. I'm talking about the fact that we've got to make a decision to say, I'm going to walk with God. I'm not just going to fall down. I'm not just going to have a failure. I'm not just going to have a setback and go, oh, it's one too many setbacks. We're not into setbacks. But guess what? Setbacks may happen. But the enemy is plotting and planning to try and nail you to the ground and saying, your setback is so bad you will not recover from this. Ever been there before? You ever had somebody had a business that said, well, you know what, we went broke, therefore you can't make it again? Some of the most successful business people are people that got back up and said, we're going to take another kick at this cat. We're going to, we're, we're, we're going to, we're, sorry, Yvonne, we're going to kick at the cat. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to, we're going to get back up again and we're going to move forward. You ever had some healing that you were believing God for? Believing God to see supernatural change, supernatural things to happen in your life, and suddenly it seemed like you got, she was none better, but rather grew worse, and it seemed to just go backwards, backwards, backwards? See, the enemy is plotting and planning to try and stop you from moving forward. But God has good in store for you, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But you first of all got to recognize, in order for you to realize that there is an enemy at hand, and realize that he's ruthless and toothless. The Bible says that there roams a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How many know, we all know the word may, but do we actually stop him? Sometimes we listen to him. He's a, he can't gum you to death. He's got no teeth. He's been defeated. That's the truth. They say that the old lions in the jungle, the kings, the king of the lions, they're actually, they roar, but they don't have any teeth anymore because they're old. The enemy does not have any teeth. He's kind of like a little old dog trying to kind of just get yappy at you. And you maybe just need to stomp your foot and say, get. You maybe need to do that. You need to do that if the enemy's trying to plant things in your mind. You need to do that if the enemy's trying to plant sickness on you or discouragement on you or fear on you or failure on you. You need to say, stop in Jesus' name. It's not so easy to do when it's a big dog, so don't let it grow into a big dog. You need to catch this stuff before it starts. When the enemy comes in, you need to begin to say, look, it, if you're going to start coming to my door, number one, I'm not going to open the door. But number two, I'm coming with the voice of faith, and I'm going to say, you are not going to try and take my mind. You're not going to try and take my kids. You're not going to try and take my faith, because God lives on the inside of me, and what the enemy is meant for harm, God will turn around for good. Amen. Now, you've got to understand, in this earth, the enemy roams around. He's the God of this world. You need to recognize that. That's why the attacks don't stop. God does not have a big magic wand over the earth that says, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to just make sure everybody's okay. Okay? That will happen when Jesus comes back. But until then, because of the Adam, the, uh, if you would, Adam and Eve fell in the garden. 
The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That means Jesus was with God coming to redeem mankind because he knew that Adam and Eve would fall and commit high treason. Well, what does high treason mean? It means they gave the earth over to Satan. Okay? Therefore, Satan is now the God of this world. That's a scripture. And we know that he walks to and fro in this earth, seeking whom he may devour. Now, the difference is, the reason why we get saved is so that we can arm ourselves to come against him. Now, how fair would it be if God said, anybody living in Canada, I'm going to make sure that they're warm and happy and well-fed and, and, and food and clothes, but all the ones over in Africa, we're going to let them die with flies on them. That's not the kind of God that we serve. God would not do that. But the enemy from the beginning of time has plotted and planned to try and ruin mankind. But Jesus came that we might have life and life in abundance. That's the other part of John 10.10. 10. But you and I are the hands and the feet. I tell you about Guatemala, we can't just snap our fingers and say, everybody in Guatemala that's got an addiction problem or is an alcoholic or a prostitute or something's really bad, you're all just going to be okay because we stayed at home and prayed. Prayer is absolutely important. Bathe it in prayer, but put some bucks behind it so that people with their hands and feet can go there and show them the light of Jesus. Yeah. So you see...